Good to see you guys tonight. Who's excited to be here? Me too. Because God is here. That's why we're here. Who was here last week? Who had a good time last week? God's been moving in this place. We got 50 people who got baptized last week. If you got baptized last week, stand up to your feet. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. That is a big deal. We are excited. You may be seated. Man, I'm so excited about what God is doing in our lives. He is working miracles right in our midst, changing people's lives. Every person who got baptized last week, you went down one person and you came up a new person. But can I tell you that new person has some challenges? Anybody experienced that after you got baptized? It was like, oh man, I thought it was just going to be glory and praise. And you realize, oh wow, I didn't just step into... Uh, ease of life, but I actually stepped into a battle. But can I tell you that your God is present with you in this battle and you are following Jesus, the one who is all victorious. He's won the battle already. We watch him in the scriptures walk through battles and ultimately come out victorious and then he invites us into his victory. And that's ultimately what we are experiencing right now. The fact that we get to worship here together, the fact that we get to gather in freedom and experience the presence of God is because Jesus is victorious. Amen? It's a privilege that we have to be able to even have a relationship with God. And when God moves like he is doing right now, And when God moves in our lives, like he did for many of us last week, there were were many baptisms, but but last week was just a special, it was a special night. We had Pastor Dennis, one of our our, our founding pastors here, preaching. He was sharing some of his experiences with revival and, um, and invited us to step into an experience with God. And God moved really powerfully. And, and I think the, the question is then, well, what do we do? What do we do now? We have this amazing privilege to be in the presence of God and have experiences with God. But then what? What do we do now? That's what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, I want to talk from the subject of response required. That's the title of tonight's message. Response required. In case you can't tell from the title, I'm implying that when God does something in our lives, it is not just for our observation, it is not for us to just be onlookers, but it is actually inviting a response to him. God is not wasting his time in your life or in my life. Everything that he does to engage us, he is inviting us to respond to. And when we engage with God, we are inviting him to respond. And so many of us, we stepped into the baptismal pool and got baptized. And the expectation was that God would respond. Right? We didn't go down into the water for nothing to happen after, for nothing to be different, for our lives to be the same. No, the expectation was, hey, I'm going to give my life to God and I expect him to respond to me. I expect him to come through on all the things that he's promised. I expect him to actually act on the things that he said he would do. That's why I'm doing this. Because I want God to respond to me. And I'm here to present to us tonight that just as much as you want God to respond to you, who in here has prayed before? Lift your hand if you've prayed before. That means that you have at one time wanted God to respond to you. Can I tell you that God wants you to respond to him as well. God wants you to respond to him as well. And many of us, we can go through our lives just wanting a response from God. But God wants a response from us. 
This is why he's created us as these magnificent beings made in his image with free will and the free choice to do what? Respond to him. There's always been an invitation for you and I to respond to God. I want us to look at a passage tonight alluding to this. This was a very special time in the history of humanity. We, we look at the Bible and we see uh, several histories being told at once because we see the history of the people of Israel being told in what we call the Old Testament. But what God was doing in the nation of Israel, in the people of Israel, he was actually doing as a part of what he was doing for you and me. And all of us. And so even when we look at their history, we kind of see our history because we see what God was doing at that point in time with us in mind. What God was doing at this point in time, he was doing with you in mind. This is why it's so important that we that we look at the scriptures, because God was doing all of this with you and I in mind. In expectation that we would respond to what he's done. And so uh, this was a monumental time. To preface it a little bit, we actually talked about this a few weeks ago. I I did a message where I was talking about Solomon uh, building the temple. And and that's what we're looking at again tonight. This was the first time in, in human history where there was going to be a permanent structure built for the presence of God to dwell. This was a big deal because in, in the Garden of Eden, God creates the heavens and the earth and then he creates this garden. And in this garden, he places humanity, mankind, a man and a woman, and God dwells with them in the garden. And when they sinned against him, they were expelled from the garden, not able to be in that garden, but also expelled from that fellowship with God. And as time went on, God established a a saving plan, starting with Abraham and the people of Israel who descended from Abraham, and he rescued them out of slavery in Egypt at a certain point, brings them into a promised land, and in the wilderness that he was leading them through, because he brought them through Egypt, uh, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, and before they got to the promised land, God had Moses build what was called a tabernacle or a tent of meeting. This was a temporary structure where the presence of God would once again dwell among humankind, which was a huge deal because there had been none of that since Adam and Eve. God was not dwelling with human beings. So he has him build a temporary housing for God's presence to dwell. Years and years and years and years and years go by and and David, who's heard of David? David killed Goliath, famous guy. So David decides, man, I'm dwelling in this amazing house. I'm king of Israel. I should build a permanent structure for God. But God says, no, I actually have somebody coming after you that's going to build the permanent house for me. And then we see Solomon, David's son, get on the throne. And one of the most important things that he did, I would say the most important thing that he did, was he actually constructed this building. Solomon's temple, one of the most glorious structures to ever exist in all of humanity because it was the first time a permanent structure was constructed to house the presence of God, the God of heaven and earth who who really cannot be contained anywhere. You're talking about the God who created the galaxies that that are too big for us to explore and he would somehow put his presence in a place that humans built and they could come and worship him and pray to him and make sacrifices to him. And Solomon, because this was such a big deal, he prays this amazing prayer and he was just asking God, God, when this happens, please hear our prayers. When people pray to this place where your presence is, would you please hear their prayers, whether they're Jewish or whether they're not? Would you, would you honor and answer when people pray to this place, even when they sin against you. And when, and when they sin against you and you stop rain from falling from heaven because they've sinned against you, would you hear their prayer when they pray from this place? When plagues hit our people because they've sinned against you and, and, you, are, and you are punishing them so that they would repent and turn back to you, would you hear their prayers when they pray to this place? When locusts are eating up all of our crops, Because we've sinned against you. When we pray to this place, would you hear our prayers? 
And after Solomon is done praying, this amazing prayer where he's interceding for people, asking that God would actually respond, even though people have sinned against him and walked away from him, that he, he, Solomon can anticipate that that's going to happen. God has already said that's going to happen. He's praying this and interceding for people, and God responds in this way. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, we see this. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. These were hundreds of thousands of animals that Solomon came to sacrifice to God. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Solomon builds a temple for God. Solomon prays to God and God responds. I don't know if you caught how powerful that is, but he could have built this whole structure like many people do, how many of you guys have ever seen a temple before? Not a Christian temple. Anybody seen a temple? There's Buddhist temples, there's mosques, there's temples all over the place. So somebody building a temple is not all that big of a deal. But somebody building a temple and fire coming down from heaven and consuming everything that they've sacrificed and the glory of God filling the temple so much that the priests can't enter the temple, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What is happening? That's a big deal, that there would be a response to the one who the temple is built for. God responded. And then not only did God respond, God, God didn't respond with fire and fill the temple. And then people were like, oh, that was cool. All right. What do y'all want for lunch? Chipotle? No. They responded to God's response. This is what relationship with God actually looks like. This is the difference. This is where we could say a billion times that, that God doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. He doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. He doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. But that means that two people are responding to each other. That God is responding to me and I'm responding to him. That is relationship. Me sending up prayers, never getting a response is not a relationship. Me, me just reading instructions and following those instructions and never interacting with the person who gave the instructions is not a relationship. It is a religion. But we have the beautiful gift of relationship with God. Jesus did not come and institute a new religion. He didn't. Jesus came and offered relationship with God. Jesus came and offered relationship with God. When you respond to Jesus, you are responding to his offer of relationship with God. If you respond to Jesus and all you get is the rules, you've missed the point. You've missed it. If all you get is a couple tools, you've missed it. This is why we see the tools being manipulated and abused all over the place. And they, they don't necessarily go with relationship with God. And so we say, oh, we can speak things into existence. I have the law of attraction. I can manifest this in that because human beings, we love power. We love tools. But now whether those are legitimate or not is not what I'm going to address tonight. It's the fact that we are drawn to tools with no context. And so outside of the context... All we have is, is stuff, and we've missed the person who's provided it if it exists. And then we've missed the point of anything that God has given us. 
Because God, everything that God has given us is to be used in relationship with him. Everything, every rule that God has given is for relationship with him. These are the boundaries of relationship. God does not, God didn't just give us rules so he could look at us, obey rules. So he could just watch from heaven and look, oh, wow, they're obeying all these random rules I gave them. (laughs) Social experiment. No, he gave the boundaries of our relationship with him. This is what he always does. And we and we have a problem with rules, but rules outline boundaries of a relationship. That's the same thing that you and I do when we get into a relationship. We outline the boundaries first, if it's a healthy relationship. We outline the boundaries first, and then we experience everything that there is to experience within those boundaries. God takes Adam and Eve, places them in the boundaries of the garden, and says everything here is yours to explore. But what did he do first? He established the boundaries and then let them explore and experience everything within those boundaries and he was there with them god gives very specific instructions for how this te- how the tabernacle needed to be built and then how the temple was to be built and he was to dwell there so they could experience him he didn't just tell them to build a house and then he moved on and got busy in heaven No, he outlined the boundaries and then came and dwelt. God wants relationship with you and I, but it requires a response from us and from God. So if your relationship with God has never included a response from him, then something's got to shift there. Because you and I are not going to make it, never getting a response from God. And we're not even on the path if we're not responding to God. Response is required in relationship. Communication is required in relationship. Exchange is required in relationship. And this should be good news to you because I want a God who I can expect to respond to me. I don't want to just roll the dice and like when I die, I just we going to see. <laughs> we'll see if I was right or not. I heard somebody say that the other day. I would rather spend my life doing this and when I die, find out I was right. Uh, I want to know before then. I want to know before I spend all this time and energy that that what I'm doing actually matters. And if you are a Christian, the scriptures say that you should experience a response from God. That's what we see outlined. Jesus, Jesus tells his disciples. Jesus goes to the cross, dies, resurrects from the dead, visits his disciples, And says, now I'm telling you, go. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I have it all. So I'm commissioning you. Go into all the world. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. However, don't go anywhere until you receive a response from God to confirm the mission that I'm giving you. Don't go anywhere until you are clothed with power from on high. This is what he says. Don't go anywhere until you are clothed with power, until you receive the promise of God. These are all different translations. But what he's saying is God is going to respond. God is going to confirm. God is going to move in your life as a confirmation that he has called you. And what I've found in my life is that God responds, God moves, God speaks. When people ask why I follow Jesus, it's because I'm convinced, I'm convinced 
I'm convinced on a daily, weekly, regular basis, God is speaking, moving, confirming things in my life, doing things that only he could do. It's what keeps me going. If I only had a story from 15 years ago, I probably wouldn't be standing here right now. But it's the fact that God is alive and God responds that makes me respond to him regularly. It's why I would stand up here and say, God will respond to you. Will you respond to God? Because a response is required. A response is required. We see an example here of God responding to the people, but he didn't have to do that. He could have just been pleased with their prayer, pleased with their sacrifice, pleased with their offering, and not said anything. He could have sent a word through a prophet and been like, God appreciated that. God told me to tell you. He appreciates that, my boy. (laughs) But no, God dramatically responds. And then the people dramatically respond. And then we see a few verses down. um, God visits Solomon at night and speaks directly to Solomon in response to his prayer. And this is, um, we're going to read 2 Chronicles 7, 13 through 16. Verse 14 is what Pastor Dennis quoted last week. We're going to see it in the midst of this whole story. Uh, God says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. I wanted us to see this passage in context because it makes it that much more powerful. Um, We need to see what applies here to us and what doesn't. So you may have read that and been like, oh my gosh, God is going to command locusts and send plagues among us. No, this is the beautiful, this is the beautiful thing of having like a, a long history behind us and, and different covenants with God behind us, different agreements between God and mankind. And so God is talking to the people of Israel under the old covenant that they had before Jesus had come and paid the ultimate price for sin, before Jesus had received all the punishment that humanity should receive. And so Solomon knew that God said, hey, I'm going to bring your, the, the people of Israel into this promised land, but do not abandon me. Do not go worship these pagan gods. Don't sacrifice your children. Don't have all these crazy customs. Don't do those things because when you do those things, You will receive retribution from me. You will receive a punishment from me. And the punishment is to exact a response from you, to turn back to me. And so Solomon says, when those things happen, just hear our prayers, God. Because I know that we're going to sin against you. I know that we're going to mess up. I know that we're going to do stuff. And I know that we're going to receive a punishment for that. And so just hear our prayers, God. And God responds by saying, I will hear your prayers. And when you humble yourself, when you pray and seek my face, when you turn from your wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive you. I will heal your land. Then he says, my ears will be attentive. My eyes will be open to my temple. My eyes and my heart will be there. So what does that mean for you and I? Oh, oh, beautiful things. Because Jesus, Jesus became the ultimate high priest that interceded for us, that entered the holy of holies, the the holiest place of the temple where you and I weren't even able to go. Only the high priest could go once a year and it was to bring a sacrifice to atone for the sins of all the people. And it was really only a temporary thing and most people could not experience the presence of God. But Jesus covered all of that. So we don't have to worry about God sending plagues on his people. 
We're the people of God now, and, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon Jesus. That is what Isaiah 53 says. It says the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He was crushed for our sins, bruised for our iniquities. He, respond, he responded to our sin by taking on the punishment. And so we don't actually have to experience the punishment, but we do get the blessing. Because we are the people of God, and God still responds when his people humble themselves and pray and seek his face, he does forgive our sins. He will heal our land. He will respond. He will move. His eyes are open and are attentive to his temple. And where's his temple? In us. Under the new covenant that Jesus has established with us, we have now become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's a big deal. You and I, are the temple of God. This place that God sent fire down to and filled with his glory so much that people couldn't even step inside of it and they fell down to the ground and they bowed down with their face to the ground. That same spirit that was filling that place is now filling you and me. When we receive Jesus, this is the gospel. This is the good news. Not that God is coming with wrath for you and I, but that God came with grace for you and I, that God came for, with forgiveness for you and I, that God took on the wrath, that God took on the punishment, that God poured it all out on Jesus so that you and I could receive it, but we have to receive it and we have to respond. There is a response required. Even when we see that God sent a punishment on the people in, in that day and under that covenant, it was to get a response from them. Now, the Bible tells us that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. This is what Pastor Dennis said last week, that it is the Lord's kindness that leads us to repentance. Is it the Lord's kindness that makes us ignore him? For many of us, it is. It's the fact that he's not crushing us right now. It's the fact that he's not sending plagues on us right now. It's the fact that he's not taking all the money out of our bank account right now. It's the fact that he's not making us sick and unwell and destroying our lives. It's, it, it's his kindness toward us that actually is making us ignore him. It's the fact that he is not pouring out wrath on us when we rebel against him, when we accuse him of things, when we talk to him like he's basic, when we talk to him like he's nobody, when we talk to him like he owes us something. Like he's somebody on the street that owes us money. It's how some of us talk to God. As if he has wronged us. Wow. When he has put breath in our lungs and keeps our heart beating and even gives us breath to speak to him with and accuse him with. And it's his kindness that sometimes makes us ignore him. But his kindness is intended to lead us to respond by turning to him, by saying, God, you have not given me what I actually deserve. You, you haven't punished me. I've, I've gotten away with more than I should have gotten away with. I'm here, I'm alive when, when I don't have to be. I probably shouldn't be. The kindness of God is intended to invoke a response from you and I in the same way that he filled the temple, in the same way that he told them, hey, even when I send a punishment on you, it's to get a response from you. Now you and I have the, have the beautiful privilege of not having to experience the punishment of God. Bible tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're not receiving punishment from God. If you have made a decision to follow Jesus, you are not experiencing punishment from God. You're not. You may be experiencing challenges. You may be experiencing suffering, but so did Jesus. So did every person who followed him. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. All, the people who <laughs> wrote this stuff for us, most of them suffered and died for their relationship with God. 
crucified, burned, head cut off, suffering. But that wasn't a punishment from God. In fact, it it, it only heaped up more of a reward for them. Jesus came so that we would have life, but he wants us to respond to what he's done. And and he's, he's worthy of more than just a verbal response. Of course he's worthy of our verbal response, but the proper response to God is to reorient our lives around him. That's the proper response to God. It's not a appreciate you. It is a I'm going to shift some things. I'm going to reorient how I live based on who you are. Because I've been living based on who I am and who I know and what I've heard down here. But, But now that I know who you are, I'm going to reorient my life around you because you are worthy of that. That's the proper response to God. God doesn't just want your habits. He wants your heart. He doesn't just want to change some things that you do and change your behavior and watch it from afar. No, he wants your heart. He wants you to respond to him internally and enter into a relationship with him. This is why he said that many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and that in your name? Didn't I go to church? Didn't I pray over people? Didn't I do all these things? And he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. That's a huge statement. It's a huge statement. It means that Jesus wants to know you, not just know about you, not just know who you are. He knows who you are, but does he know you? Does he experience you? Do you engage with him? Do you respond to him? That's actually what he is inviting you and I into. And on one hand, that is very scary. On the other end, it's amazingly encouraging that, that, that Jesus is actually saying, man, if, if, I don't, if I'm not experiencing him, I'm doing it wrong. Like if I never hear the voice of God, if I never see him move in my life, and I don't mean audibly hear his voice like speaking from the heavens. That's not what I mean. But if, we can, that would be a whole nother sermon. <laughs> we'll get to that. But if I'm never seeing God move in my life, if I'm never experiencing him, ah, there's something going wrong here. Because he says that, I, that I'm supposed to know him and he's supposed to know me. He doesn't, say I'm, he doesn't say, depart from me, you don't know the scriptures. It was the people who knew the scriptures that crucified him. Plot twist. If you didn't know that, that's actually what happened. It was the people who knew the scriptures that crucified him because they felt like he was blaspheming by making himself who the scriptures were talking about. So they knew the scriptures, but they did not know God. Because when the living word came and walked among them and the fullness of God dwelling in human flesh was standing and preaching to them. They accused him of blasphemy instead of responding with repentance. So he doesn't say, depart from me. You don't know the scriptures. Depart from me. You didn't do enough. No, depart from me. I didn't know you. You showed up, but my, your heart was never open to me. You weren't available to me. But it is, it is in our, our heart responding to God, which isn't hard work. It's not hard work. It's all the other stuff we do that's hard work. We'll toil and we'll sweat and we'll build and we'll do all this stuff. And God is saying, eh. 
what's going on in here? That's what I'm concerned about. Are you open to me? Many of us, we will complain about not hearing God's voice. Are you listening? Are you? I want you to ask yourself that genuinely. Are you listening or are you talking about the fact that he's not speaking? Am I talking like God's not speaking? God's not speaking. God's not speaking. Are you listening? Are you opening the word of God that says it's alive and active? That said that it will discern the intentions of your heart. The scriptures will do that. You will hear the voice of God through the scriptures alone when you are listening. It is a heart posture. It is a response to God. That When I open the Bible, I'm expecting that God would respond to me and I'm responding to him. It's a response. And we see that in the Old Testament, but, but I actually want us to see the words of Jesus. In Matthew 11, I guess you don't understand, Siri. It's not my fault. It's not preaching to you right now. Matthew 11, verse 20, says, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Whoa! Whoa! Most of his miracles were performed in a place that people were not responding. And because of that, Jesus began to denounce these places because they did not repent. Does he say because they were not amazed? No. Does he say because they were not impressed? No. He turned water to wine. He was healing the sick, raising the dead, casting demons out of people, doing things that nobody had seen before, and they were impressed. But they did not repent. And because of that, Jesus denounced them. We're going to see what that means. Actually, I I want us to make sure we understand what repent means. I have a definition for it. It means to change one's life based on complete change of attitude and thought concerning sin and righteousness. The Greek word used there for repent means to change your mind. And what Jesus is doing is he's taking it to another level, saying not just changing your mind about an idea, but changing the way you think. And when you change the way you think, it will change what you do. And so you reorient your thinking which will then reorient your actions, which will then reorient your life because your life is the sum total of your actions. So down in, uh, right after that, verses 21 through 24, Jesus says, woe to you, Korazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. He says the word woe, which which is an exclamation of how greatly one will suffer, mingling doom with pity. It's like I feel bad for you and you're doomed. (laughs) Woe to you. It's really bad news for you. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. These were all cities in a region called Galilee. Galilee was a region that had a lot of cities in it. Nazareth is one of them. It's where Jesus is from. Cana is one of them. That's where Jesus turned water into wine. Capernaum, that's where Jesus met Simon and his brother Andrew. It's where where most of, this region is where most of his disciples are from. And it's where Jesus is from. 
And Jesus performed most of his miracles around people who were familiar with him. And because they were so familiar with him and so comfortable with him, they thought they knew better than him. And they refused to respond properly to what he had done. And, and, and so when he's saying this, he's talking to Jews who know the scriptures. He's talking to Jews who know the law, who know ultimately what's supposed to be happening. And yet they are refusing to respond to God. He wasn't talking to completely ignorant people. He was talking to people who knew the scriptures and they knew everything that he had done. And still had the arrogance to not humble themselves and respond to him. And so for him to compare Capernaum to Sodom. Sodom, anybody heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? You've heard of these cities, right? These were thousands of years before Jesus is saying this. These were pagan cities in, in the land of Canaan that, that were so bad. Sodom was so bad that Abraham is having a conversation with God. And, and God's like, I'm going to have to destroy this place. And, and, and Abraham is like, I mean, will you save it if there's like 50 righteous people there? And God says, yes. But there aren't. <laughs> and so he says, will you save it if there's like 20 righteous people there? And God says, yeah. But there aren't. What about 10, God? I'll save it if there's 10 people who will respond to me there. But there are not. What about one, God? God. I'll save it if there's one person there who will respond to me. And what does God do? God sends angels to rescue the one person who's there. And if you go read the story, it's crazy because the angels, they show up as men. They visit the one righteous person. And you go look at the story and the people are so crazy. They try to do some crazy things with these angels. And they're like banging on the door, like, give us these men. It's like, whoa, okay, I see why you're about to destroy this place. So, so God rains fire down and destroys this pagan place. And then Jesus talking to his own people who knew the scriptures, who were righteous in their own eyes. And who he had performed most of his miracles in front of. He says, it'll be better for Sodom when I judge than it'll be for you. Who has seen me move, who has heard my voice, who knows all of this and just refuses to actually respond to me. That's what God finds deplorable is apathy towards him. When he would have the humility to put on human flesh and deal with us and even walk around doing miracles. He's God. He could have stayed where he was. But he put on human flesh and dealt with the insults, dealt with the doubt, dealt with the accusations and still healed people, dealt with the fatigue of the human body and still listened to person after person and preached and healed the sick and prayed for people and raised the dead and cast out demons and multiplied food to feed people and they still doubted him. And then after this, verse 25 says, at that time, it says Jesus prayed. It says, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What is Jesus saying here? How does this go with what just happened? He's comparing two conditions of people. And he says, Father, you've hidden these things from those who think they know it all and are too prideful to see it. Wise and learned, he's referring to prideful people. Little children, he's referring to humble people. How do we know this? Because was it only children who got saved? Was it children that were following him as disciples? No, these were adults. So why is he calling them little children? Well, he said elsewhere that unless you become like a little child, 
you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you have such an immense humility that you'll admit to knowing nothing and be okay with that, that you won't be able to receive him. This was their problem, is they would not humble themselves and move past their assumptions of who he is, of what he should be doing. They would not move past their accusations. They would not move past their pride. They would not put those things down and just receive what he wanted to do. And so they couldn't see who Jesus really was. And Jesus wasn't judging their knowledge. He was judging their response to him. He was judging the condition of their heart. You and I, we don't have to know it all, but it is important how we respond to God. You don't have to know all the theology. You don't have to know every scripture in the Bible. You don't have to know any of the names of the cities that I'm talking about. But when God moves in your life, when God draws on your heart, when God reveals himself to you and invites you to come into relationship with him, how you respond to that is what he's evaluating. So you and I, we, the Bible tells us that each and every one of us will have to give an account before God. This is what the scriptures tell us, that we'll have to give an account for God to God, that you don't get to walk around living this life in this body that you've been given with no responsibility, with no accountability. None of us walk around with no accountability, there is an expectation for you to respond to God. Romans 1 tells us that what is to be known about God can be perceived even if you don't know the scriptures. If you look around you, you can see who God is. Look at the person next to you, you can see who God is. Because where did they come from? Where did any of this come from? We got trees outside. We got animals. There's zebras. You don't say there's no God. There's zebras running around. Not quite a horse, but it's a zebra and it's got stripes and all of them have stripes. It's weird. There are more species than we can even name. It, everything around us... You breathe, and what is that? Why is that required for me to live? God has, has woven his nature into creation. He has woven himself into nature. So much so that he says, you should be able to deduce who I am to some degree without ever hearing a passage of scripture. Maybe that's why so many cultures have gods that they worship. Maybe this is why religion and spirituality finds its way into every crevice of humanity and you typically don't find an unreached people group who have no concept of spirituality. It's because we have something on the inside of us that longs for what is outside of us and what is greater than us and God is saying, and now I have revealed to you who I am. Because I didn't have to. You could have been down there guessing. I've revealed to you who I am. I put on your human flesh suit, walked around, and my name is still the most famous name on the planet. The name of Jesus is the most famous name on the planet. Much more famous than any other name you can name. The Bible is the most circulated book. On the whole planet. Is God not working? Is God not revealing himself to people? Is God not making it plain? Or are we not responding? Are we not impressed? Are we seeing all these things and we say, yeah, maybe. Maybe not. Like they did. And after this, after he says, whoa, whoa to all these people, and after he says that it is only, it, it, it's a little children that God has revealed himself to, then we find the passage right after this. I mean, the next verse is where he says something that's familiar to many of us, but, but we only hear it like on its own, not with all this other stuff. It's in the same place, in the same conversation, Jesus says, come to me. 
all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's crying out to people for them to see who he, who he is and the beauty of what he's offering. When he uses this analogy, this illustration of a yoke, he's pulling on several different cultural things. One, a yoke, is, is a, it's an instrument that you use to tie oxen together around their neck for them to plow fields, for them to work with. But in Jewish culture, they often refer to their teaching as a yoke. And the law of Moses, they referred to as a yoke that they would put on, that they would put on the yoke of the law and all of its stipulations. And it was like this badge of honor that I put on the yoke of the law. And Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. It's not about the law. It's about who, who I am. It's about, it's about who breathed the law. Take my yoke upon you. It's not meant to be heavy. It's not meant to be burdensome. In fact, he says, come to me when you are weary. Come to me when you are burdened, when you are carrying a heavy load. I will give you rest. And when you come to me, put my yoke upon you. When I put my teaching upon you, when I put my commandments upon you, when I put my instructions upon you, you will actually find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls Under the teachings of Jesus, you will find restoration under the teachings of Jesus. It's outside of him that you get weary. It's outside of him that you get burdened. It's outside of him that you work and work and work and work and never really receive the full reward you were going for. And under him, it's not that he's saying there's no work because the yoke implies that there is work. He's saying that you won't be heavily burdened, that you can find rest for your souls even as you're working. And maybe that's the way work was supposed to be. When we're actually in relationship with God, this response that Jesus is looking for is not just a, I'll worship you and take on all the burden and all the heaviness of all of your godliness. No. He's saying, if you would respond to me and repent, you would actually find beauty. You would find rest. You would find fulfillment. I didn't come to burden you. You're already burdened. That's the problem. I didn't come to worry you. You're worried. That's the problem. I didn't come to overwhelm you. I came because you're overwhelmed. And you're ignoring me. Jesus came so that we would have life. He says that he's the good shepherd and he's come so that the sheep would have life and have it to the full. The fullness of life is what God desires for you. But your response is required. And the way you come to Jesus is with the humility of a little child. It's how you come to God. (sighs) Isaiah 57, 15 says this. For this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And if you don't know what contrite means, to be contrite is to be crushed. It describes being pushed down to a low place with pressure. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. But when you feel like life is just like weighing on top of you and you're down low and you're going through it and you don't know how to go forward, when you don't know how to get yourself out of the situation you're in, God says, I dwell in a high and holy place In heaven and on earth, I'm with these people, the people who are down low, the people who know they need something, the people who need a savior, the people who need rescuing, the people who need a healer, the people who need a provider, the people who need somebody to help them. And all of those who need no help, I have no help for. But it is in the heart posture of needing God the acknowledgement of his ability to meet our need 
that's where he meets us. And for me, this is, this is beautiful news because I, I'm somebody who likes to figure it out personally. And naturally, I'm a pretty driven person. Naturally, I'm a pretty ambitious person. This is why it took a while for God to actually get a hold of me because I was dead set on doing things my way. And when I look back at all the sin that I committed, all the ways that I just ignored God, ignored God. I wasn't like coming to church, serving, and then sinning a little bit. I was like sinning so much that I didn't want to talk about church. I, didn't, don't, I don't want to talk about God. That might spur some level of conviction. <laughs> and this was years, years that I was like, not one foot in, one foot out. I mean, both feet in sin. <laughs> All the way. And I was thinking about it even just a few days ago, just... Man, all the, all the sin. It's like, it was coming to my mind. I'm like, is this the devil? What is going on? I forgot about that one. My goodness. And, and it, was like, it was like a gift to me, though. Because sometimes, sometimes I could get in my head Man, I, I can just be worried about all the things that I feel like need to happen or need to get fixed or all the things that I feel like God needs to do in my life. And I can just ignore all of what he's already done. Like the fact that I'm standing here before you preaching the gospel is a miracle. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve the opportunity. I don't deserve the privilege. I don't. I don't deserve it. It is just his mercy, his kindness. And all I can say is that at some point I just responded to God. And I, and I said, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how to stop sinning. I don't know what my life looks like without sin in it. But I know that that's what you're asking of me. And I'm responding to you. And I believe you when you say that you can help me figure it out. Yes. And so if you found yourself in that place, you're in the right place. If you found yourself low, you're in the right place. If you found yourself in need, you're in the right place. Because God meets with us there. Jesus said about himself that he was lowly, gentle, and humble in heart. That's what Jesus said about himself. So he's not dwelling with the prideful. He's dwelling with the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and in due time he will exalt you. This is what his word says. This is, this is the beauty, that it's not about striving. It's not about figuring everything out for yourself. It's about humbling yourself and responding to God. I think you can do that. I, I know that I wasn't able to figure out everything in my life, where it would all lead. I never thought that it would be here. I'll tell you that. That in my time of response, it was not like, God, I'm responding to being a young adult's pastor. <laughs> no, I didn't have any of that in, in my mind. I, I couldn't foresee that happening. If you would have told me that that's what I was responding to, I would have been like, that's probably harder to believe than just me getting saved right now, okay? <laughs> but God is able to do what he, what he promises he will do, which is forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I just want us to stand to our feet. We're going to close here. And it's interesting. I was thinking about this the other night. Gabrielle and I, we have a nine-month-old baby boy named Noah, if you are new here. Um, and He's a baby, and so he doesn't have any issues with being humble. He doesn't. It's like he's used to needing stuff. 
He's not trying to figure out anything for his own, on his own. And so when he says little children, he comes to mind. And I was literally thinking about this at like 3 a.m. when Noah woke up because he had somehow peed through his diaper. All right? And I'm only giving you those details because when he did, he had, he had wet himself. But he's a baby, right? And he's crying. So we have the monitor. I can see him. I can hear him. He's crying. Ah! Ah! It's like he's calling for me and Gabrielle. And he's not saying, hey, mom and dad, I peed myself. I need you to come in here. I need you to unzip my little night sack and I need you to change my diaper and wipe me with the baby wipe and then dry me off and moisturize me and then and then rock me back to sleep and give he doesn't give us all the details he just lets us know that he's in need and then and then we do all the rest his father will come in and do all the rest do all the work his mother will come in and do all the rest and do all the work. So I don't know where you're at in life right now. I don't, I don't know what you have to figure out. But what I do know is that that is the only response that God is asking for from you. It is an acknowledgement of your need and he will come in and do the rest. He'll come in and do the rest. He says that he, he dwells with the one who is contrite, who is crushed and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. And he's not talking about a blood pumping organ. That, that language is talking about the inner being, the inner person, the heart of a person, the mind of a person. Those of us who feel crushed in our minds, who feel lowly in our minds, who feel depressed in our minds. It is the spirit of God that comes in to dwell with us and to revive us, to lift us up, to lift us from the lowly place to revive us, to awaken us. That's who does it. That's who does it. And so we're about to have the worship team come out here. And this is a, this is a response time. This is response time. There's a response required. God's been moving in here. He's been moving in people's lives. Maybe he's been moving in your life. It's time to respond. It's time to respond. It's time to respond. It's time to respond. Some of us have just been observing. We've been observing. We've been looking. We've been listening. We've been hearing, but not responding. When we're worshiping, it is a response to God. When we pray, it is a response to God but ultimately it is the reorienting of our lives that he desires. And, and not that we change our lives, it's that we reorient our lives and say, I'm going to follow you. You're gonna to have to figure the rest out. You're gonna to have to show me what to do. I don't even know how to be this person that I feel like you're calling me to be. I don't know how to clean myself up. I don't know how to free myself. I don't know how to think differently. I'm just opening myself up to the possibility of it, and I'm inviting you to come wash me. I'm inviting you to come clean me. I'm inviting you to come change me like a little child would. And so I, I wanna pray for us in this moment. And then I wanna invite us into a response time. Whew. Lord, I thank you that you have chosen to hide these things from the prideful and have revealed them to little children, God. I thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to anyone who's willing to see you, who's willing to humble themselves, who's willing to acknowledge who you are. And God, I thank you for your desire for relationship with us. Lord, that you don't want to watch our behaviors from afar, but you want to know us from up close. And so, Lord, I just pray that by your spirit, 
you would move in the hearts of your people right now. God, I pray for you to revive the spirit of the lowly, for you to revive the heart of the contrite. God, everyone who's felt cr crushed by life, who's felt crushed by circumstances, God, I declare revival over them right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, for every person who's felt lowly, who's felt down, who's felt confused, who, who doesn't feel like they have it figured out, I declare revival over them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for every person who's on the fence, for every person who's wondering, is it worth it? Are you worth it? Are you worth it? Are you worth it? God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would open their eyes to see who you really are. God, that there is no one more worthy than you. There is nothing more worthy than you. There is no glory greater than yours. There is nothing more beautiful than you, God. There is no one more powerful than you, more majestic than you, more loving than you, God. There is nothing in all of creation that could ever outshine its creator. So, Father, would you help us to see you? We need to experience you. Holy Spirit of God, we welcome you in this place. I feel in this moment is so important. Before we go into worship, I was going to move past and do salvation call later. I feel it's so important for anybody in here or watching online that you haven't been walking with Jesus and you're saying it's response time. Tonight is the night. I want you to lift your hand high in the air so I can pray with you. It's response time. It's response time. Lift your hand. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. It's okay. It's response time. It's response time. There was a time for listening. There was a time for contemplating. There was a time for thinking about it. There was a time for figuring it out. Now's response time. God has already moved in your life. He's already moved in your heart. He's already responded to you. There's hands going up all over the building. We all have an opportunity here. This is the most important decision that we make. If you're watching online, I want your hands high in the air. It's response time. If that's you, you have your hand in the air right now. You are making a decision right now, humbling yourself before God, saying, God, I don't know how to do it all, but I'm inviting you to work in me, to work through me, to shift me, to change me, to cleanse me, to forgive me. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, the holy, matchless God. I believe that you put on human flesh. You lived a sinless life. And you died on a cross to take the punishment for my sins. I believe that the punishment that brought me peace was on you. I believe that you died, that you resurrected, that you are alive, that you have all power, all authority, that you can forgive me and I receive your forgiveness of my sins. I'm not who I used to be. Wash me clean, make me new. I repent, I reorient, I'm changing my mind, I'm responding to you, I'm turning away from my old life, I'm turning fully to you. You are the Lord of my life, the leader of my life, because you have saved my soul. I'm yours forever, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this place, God. I thank you for every person who just made a decision for you to follow you, God. And I thank you for all of your children who are making a decision to respond to you right now, God. To respond to the way that you've revived us. To respond to the glory that you have shown us, Lord. To respond to what you've done in our lives. God, I thank you for every person who got baptized last week who's responding. Who's responding who's responding. I thank you for every person who got baptized this year, last year, God, every person who's been walking with you. But tonight is a night of response. God, I thank you that you've changed their life. You've washed them clean. You've made them new. And tonight is a night of response. God, I pray that you would receive, receive, 
receive. God, you give us so much. You give us so much, God. I pray that you would receive from us in this moment, that you would receive our worship in this moment. You would receive our praise in this moment, receive our prayers in this moment, receive open hearts in this moment, God. And I pray that you would be lifted high and glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.